You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! Now, I've said this uh, many times before when we uh, interview people that we um, like to interview people of interest. We have interviewed, and I'll, I know I've said this before, we've interviewed sports people, we've interviewed politicians, we've interviewed uh, people from all sections and genres of life, and um, today is no different because um, this person I'm about to introduce announced his retirement from uh, the very important job that he had in uh, the community and uh, we thought, um, well I thought I'd like to speak to him because he's a, um, he's a controversial figure and um, uh, everyone's a controversial figure or we wouldn't speak to them. In some ways people are controversial and uh, I'd like to welcome the well, I suppose he still is the Victorian Secretary of the CFMEU. Incidentally, CF, it should be CFMEU, but it's just CFMEU. Uh, he is still the Victorian Secretary of that, I think, unless he's, uh, I've missed something in the interim. Uh, and I'd like to welcome John Setka to You Cannot Be Serious. Hello, John. Hello, Sam. Thanks, uh, Wayne. Are you still? What are you? I'm still the state secretary till the end of the year. Oh, so, till the end yeah, of the year. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the first bit of research I should have done. I should have known that. But yeah. I, I just saw in the tissues that you were uh, retiring, and you've been the uh, secretary for since 2012. Uh, no? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Twi at the end of my term, it'll be 12 years. Yes. I mention a lot of facts to people we interview, and most of them are wrong. And they say, well, why don't you do your research? I said, because uh, the stuff I do re of my research on sometimes is not updated and sometimes it's incorrect. Uh, now, first of all, why are you uh, retiring? Well, so you're, uh, you're 60. Yeah, well, look, I'm going to be 60 in September this year. Mm. Uh, the sixth for that. anyone that wants to know anyway. And... Uh, Look, I said right from the start of my term, my last term, that this was going to be my last term. I mean, my dad retired at 55 from the construction industry. So I sort of, I can't, obviously couldn't retire at 55. So I said, when I turn 60, I'm going to retire. Works out perfectly. My term ends uh, at the end of the year and I'll be 60 and, and it's a good time for me to go to unions at a all-time high membership and uh, yeah, it's in, a, it's in a good spot. Now, I'll just get on to your dad in a minute, uh, but... Um what are you going to do then? At 60, you've got to do something, John. What are your interests? Uh, could I just say, as we're on the eve of Taylor Swift <laughs> taking the, the city by storm, you're not a Swifty, eh? You're not going I, along I, to that. I wouldn't know one song. If you blowtorch me now, I wouldn't be able to tell you one song she sings. Well, have you had anything to do with... Uh, the construction of the joint or no, making no, sure everything no, you I kept well no, out of that? No, I haven't. I'm just trying to avoid the traffic, I suppose. Yeah, but no, I, I don't. It's no. A, so you're not a Swifty. What, what, what would you listen to is a matter of interest? Oh, look, if you, I, I grew up. If you so sat down me. with a glass of uh, bitterly cold, <laughs> yeah. what would you listen to? ACDC, my favourite. ACDC, yes. yeah. Yeah, ACDC. Uh, you know, good old Aussie band. Yes. I remember they used to open up playing in the Footscray Mall. Once, you know, so... Uh, ACDC uh, yes, did? Yeah, did ACDC, they? yeah. And uh, I think it was outside the old Commonwealth Bank there. So then then the, a lot of people don't realise, once they went to America, that's when they become real international sort of band. But uh, They did. They were huge there. in yeah, America. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. They, they're my favourites still to this day. All-time classics. Now, this is what you're known as. This is... You're known as a controversial figure in the Australian trade union movement. You're a known as a very strong supporter of the grassroots level of people in the community. Um, um, you are a strong advocate uh, for um, political and legal opponents that are against you, and you are, someone said, the most fair income union person in the country. That's, that's what they say about you on that side. And then others have said... Your detractors, I, I, I'm, uh, I can resonate with this because this is vague, vaguely what they say about me, except uh, you're more, far more important than me. Your opponents say you're a bully, you break the law to further union interests, and you, your criticism on remarks on domestic violence got you in so much trouble or, or that you got expelled from the ALP in 2019. So that's the good, and that, that's the famous, and that's the infamous. Yeah. So I want to know, John, I know 
Did you get started because your dad lost his life in the 1970 collapse of the Westgate Bridge? I think your dad's just left us recently, yeah, he, has yes, he? Yes, yeah, he survived. He was one of the survivors of the Westgate collapse. But he passed recently, did he? Yes, you? last year. Yeah. Yes, well, we, we, we uh, send our, we offer you our condolences for that. Thank uh, you. So did you get involved in the... Uh, well, you couldn't have got involved in the union movement because no. of that, but because you're too young. But as a result of that, did you uh, take an interest in uh, the safety and what goes on for the rank and file who uh, actually helped build the country? Look, look, it was a it was a big factor for me. I mean, I remember I, I was in Bubs actually uh, when when the bridge collapsed, and uh, I remember uh, back then you, know, you have vivid memories of certain things. And I remember, uh, I mean, there was a lot of union people that actually looked after my dad after that. He was one of the 18 survivors. And I remember later on, my dad always got sort of pretty good jobs because he'd had a back operation, he had some serious injuries. So From, from the collapse? From, from the collapse, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and to see the, uh, uh, the, the union, you know, back then sort of look after him and make sure he had a good job and, and he'd be on a job, say, as an Ali Mac driver or as a rigger, just to see that, was even years later was fantastic for me and I sort of thought how's this you know I mean he survived the tragedy and his union has sort of looked after him so um, yeah when I've seen that and, and safety obviously I mean I go to the memorials and you see 35 other families there every yep. every year and you, you sort of think you know I could have grew up without a dad I could have you know like I used to when I'd go to Williamstown I'd drive past that memorial and I think gee I'm so lucky my dad's name's not on there so it sort of does drive you a bit, yeah, you know, uh, w w when you sort of experience all that. I was in a pub with Doug Wade, who played football for Geelong. He and I were business partners. I, I was in a pub in 1970 in Footscray, and uh, we actually heard, uh, came out and saw the dust uh, rising into the yeah. uh, sky. Uh, we, we didn't see it collapse, but uh, we were there... About 10 seconds out in the footpath looking at the dust in there. Uh, and that was as a result of um, um, build a, b b construction negligence, yeah. Yeah. Was, it was it? Well, it was engineering because what they worked out is the bridge was going to not join up properly, like one bit was going to be higher than the other. Yeah. So they whacked a whole heap of concrete blocks on one end and then started unloosening the bolts. So uh, that obviously we know how that ended. Um, uh, so that was really an engineering uh a problem and 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 the workers on the bridge had actually expressed a concern and one of the people they? That, yeah that expressed a concern about you know bolts turning blue and creaking and and one of the engineers that was there who actually died on the bridge sort of said this bridge is safe i i i uh, bet my life on it and he he was one of the ones that got killed on the bridge how you know, ironic down. yeah yeah so uh you know, obviously the union back then didn't have the engineering expertise we have now to be able to send out experts out there to get a second opinion. Um, so, I mean, that bridge collapse actually redefined Victoria, like the health and safety. We've got some of the toughest health and safety laws. Uh, the trade union movement is seen as stronger here, and I think a lot of that was because of that, you know, it's Australia's worst industrial uh, uh, yep. Accident. accident and I think it galvanised the whole trade union movement and workers and that and, yeah. and and people started taking safety seriously after that. It'd be fair to say the uh, trade union movement is strongest here because of someone like your good self, John, who uh, takes no prisoners. Oh, Eureka Stockade, maybe it was, it was in uh, Victoria. <laughs> uh, they <laughs> say, just as a matter of interest, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but yeah. uh, the. Bridge is in a constant state of repair, twenty four seven. There's bolts falling out of it. I don't want to. This yep. is. I'm sure it's uh, very stringently uh, overseen now. But there's. Uh, it's. Uh, it's quite a. Quite a uh, continuing job to keep the thing in the air. Oh yeah. Look, I'm not look, sure look, if that's uh, too extravagant yeah. to say that, but look, they've done some major works on there. Sort of upgrades. They put the obviously the suicide barriers because there was a lot of people sort of jumping off. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, but they also strengthened it and done the upgrades. It's like it's like the Sydney Harbour Bridge. They're constantly maintaining it. I mean, when you think built in 1970, you know the, it's pretty old. Like the bridge is over 50 years old, so there'd be a lot of maintenance. There'd be full time maintenance crews on there. Now the uh, CFMEU is an adjunct or a uh, or is a continuation of uh, Norm Gallagher's uh, Builders Labor's Federation, isn't it? I remember <laughs> Norm who said the uh, light towers at the MCG would never be built as yep. we go and watch Taylor Swift uh, tomorrow <laughs> night and see the lights blazing. Uh, so Norm, did you know Norm? I worked. That's where I started my career as a union official with the BLF under Norm. Yeah. So. Um, 
That's why I've got the old. <laughs> that's where my career started. I see. Um, I haven't. Uh, yeah, uh, John is pointing to a tattoo on his yeah. forearm. A very look like, like Popeye. Your <laughs> forearms are huge. Um, but I haven't uh, bothered to uh, read what's on your body yet, John. We might. Uh, I might have a crack at that after <laughs> we finish. Yeah. So yeah. So that's where I started my career working for uh, Norm Gallagher. Did you? And uh, uh, what did Norm teach you? Oh, look, uh, look, I, I found, look... To we, build we, the capitalists. Yeah, yeah, look, there, there, there was probably a bit of that, I mean, but... Built, look, the, built the fat cats. Not really, there is this perception of that, but I mean, he, he was a pragmatist, really, when you think about it, and you think he sort of took the builder's labourer out of the gutter and uh, made him a highly paid, skilled labourer, you know, some of the highest paid, you know, in, in the country, and, and safety, banning asbestos, I mean... Yeah. You know, he saved a lot of landmarks in, in, in Melbourne, like the Vic Market, that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Norm, the pool, you know, the Carlton pools and all that, so a lot of the Regent wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Norm Gallagher, so uh, he left his mark and, and uh, he, he's, you know, you talked to a lot of the old timers that were around in the 60s and 70s, you couldn't say a bad word about Norm, they all, they all loved him because he, he, he looked after him. Now, uh, you're sounding like as though you're a pussycat, uh, John, that's a very calm uh, gentleman, and you probably are uh, on, on various aspects of, of your life, but it says you are a persuasive, a pervasive, not persuasive, a pervasive power over the construction companies. That is, and it says that you will go to any means to um, enforce what you want, even if it is to break the law. Is that a fair comment, and is that justified? Oh, look, it, it's probably taken out of context when they say break the law. We might break some industrial laws. I mean, hardly a, a crime of the century you get sent to Alcatraz for or, 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 or hung for. I mean, you know, you know, we, we, I've had politicians sort of say we're the, uh, yeah, the biggest reactivist uh, lawbreakers, but I mean, they're not criminal laws, they're industrial laws. And I mean, sometimes to get an outcome, you know, the law's not... You know, the law's not there to sort of protect workers sometimes. You know, they're, they're, and, and sometimes, you know, if, it, if the difference is between me preserving someone's life or making sure they go home safe that day or I've got to break the law to go on that building site, I will do that, you know. Um, yeah. I'd rather do that than have to answer to that family why their uh, son or daughter ain't coming home because I had to abide by this little shitty law that was designed to never let us win, you know. It's a bit like playing footy and you kick all these goals and they say, well, sorry, that ain't count now because we've just moved the goalpost. So... When you've got bad laws, I mean, my, my view is if you've got bad laws, you, you, it, it's your obligation to sort of break them. It's a bit like saying you um, you broke the law by speeding. You were doing 102 in a 100 zone, but you actually uh, clinically did break the law by yeah. doing two kilometres an hour over the speed limit, John. Yeah, well, look, look. Is that helping you out with anything? More, more or less. Look, there's some, really bad, there's some really restrictive bad laws that are designed to never let you win as a union, and if you abide by them laws, you won't win. We, we defied some of them laws and we've been criticised for it, but I mean, hardly the crime of the century. So you weren't happy with, um, you, you weren't happy with the um, a, 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 ABCC, the, what am I talking about? Yeah, yeah. The yeah, the uh, Australian Building and Construction um, C- Commission. You weren't happy with them because of... Um, uh, some reason, and you decided then you would um, dox, I think is the word, dox their, uh, dox the people who li- who were uh, part of the commission by sending them letters, or standing outside their homes, or telling people yeah. where they, uh, telling yeah. your reunion members where they lived, yeah. and um, to, uh, is that vaguely right? No, look, I had no time for them, uh, and, and going to their houses and that is, is absolute, that, that's never ever happened, there's never, never happened. been, a, that never happened, I mean... Uh, you know, people have got family. You don't do. You don't go to people's houses. You know, um, but uh, look, we did hate them. They, they were there to destroy us. They were part of the Howard era uh, government. They sort of denied building workers' rights. They took away our rights. They had secret commissions where you could get dragged in and you had to answer questions. Otherwise, you could go to jail. I mean, a bit like uh, North Korea would be jealous of some of these uh, laws that they had, and they had all these sweeping powers, and um, it was just. It was un-Austra- To be quite honest, it was un-Australian what they did. I mean, this is supposed to be a free country, uh, free speech. We always talk about a fair go for everyone. That's Australia's motto, even though I think that's dissipated, to be quite honest. Um, 
and they were brought into sort of really, you know, there was a separate law for construction workers as what there was to other workers, and we thought, how un Australian is that? So that's why we hated them. And so you mentioned John Howard, but you uh, you were sort of. Um Equal handed with your criticism because you um, didn't like, you had a bit of an issue with Kevin Rudd at some stage. I think you said something uh, uncharitable oh. about, about him. So uh, you yep. were, it was a bipartisan criticism. You weren't just, uh, if people did the wrong thing in your, in, yeah. in, in your eyes, it didn't matter what side of the ledger they came from. Well, for me, I'm not an apologist for the ALP. If the ALP make a mistake or they do something we don't like, we've been very, we've been even more critical of them, to be quite honest. I mean, um, yeah, so it doesn't matter what side of politics. I mean, we'll, we'll have a crack, and we've been unpopular for that because people have come to me and sort of said, oh, you can't say that. I shouldn't say that about... But it's true. Oh, well, you should, shouldn't say that. And I said, well, you want me to lie? Oh, they go, no. I said, well, what do you want me to just say nothing? So, I mean, the members of the union, they pay my wages to represent them. So they're my bosses. So yeah. if we've got a cause or a, or, or, or a claim... I mean, I, I'm obligated to whether I agree with it or not. That's what my members want me to do. That's what I do. Now, uh, Mick Gatto, I, I presume you're. A, I, don't, I presume you're a friend of Mick Gatto's. Uh, Mick Gatto yes. said, um, I, "I know Mick." He said, um, "There'd be a very good chance if you stood to be the prime minister of the country, you might actually uh, be surprised at how many people might vote for you." Oh, well, what about that? Uh, thanks. Look, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think and that's probably not going to happen, John. Because yeah. but but it's I a go nice through concept. your background, like they go through my background whenever I'm after a job, they say, "Oh, well, did you say yeah. this and did you do that?" And I say, "Well, I did," but that's a bit bit yeah. the same. But um, you couldn't stand the scrutiny. But uh, I think yeah. uh, uh, theoretically, uh, he might be onto something there, John. I I don't think that'll last because. I'm too truthful, I suppose. So, I mean, uh, I'll tell the truth and sometimes people don't like the truth. So Maybe uh, that's what people are looking for in politicians. I think they are. Uh, um, we call it back to basics, grassroots, and I think some of them have lost that. Um, but look, hopefully one day we'll, we'll restore Australia back to what it should be and what it used to be, you know. So... Um I don't want to keep bringing up things that you've been accused <laughs> of, but they're just interesting. It gives you a chance to actually have your point of view. Now, you got charged with blackmailing... Was it Borrell? No, who was it? Borrell, yeah, Borrell. How, how did you get charged? What did you do to be charged? I, I think you got exonerated, didn't you? Yes, you yes, got the whole cleared case. cleared of this. Yes, whole case so collapsed. This was, a, this was a conspiracy theory by the employers to run you out of office and... Uh, have you running a little scared? But uh, it backfired on them, did it not? Or how did that start, well, John? Well, how it started was uh, we had a dispute with Grocon. The good old Grocon used to be around. And, um, and it was after the war collapse. It killed them three three kids. And uh, we sat in. I sat in and had, a, had breakfast with Borrell, to be quite, which I paid for, believe it or not, and had a good laugh and, and spoke to them about our, our, our dramas that we were having. And anyway, 18 months later, they discovered God, as you'd say it. There was a Royal Commission that was on and Borrell decided to play a political game because there was some American bloke that was out here called Mike Kane and who reckons he took on the Teamsters and all that. And he went to the Hayden Royal Commission and reckons that we effectively were blackmailing them. And uh, How were you blackmailing them? What, what well, Blackmailing well, them is uh, uh, saying you'll do something if they don't do something. How, 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 what did you do? Well, we or actually it was proved that did. we actually hadn't done anything, but the allegation was that we were... And they were never actually specific on it, right? So what they were actually trying to do is they were trying to make industrial... It, it'd be like now me sitting Withdrawing down from, your labour from their business or...? Well, we, we don't really have people in their business. They sort of supply concrete, yeah. but, I mean, we, we sort of spoke to them about we were having a problem with Grocon and they should stay out of it. Um, you spoke to them, uh, John. Yeah, yeah, you? we had a. You civil went down and said, "Hello, gentlemen, uh, how are you going?" And or did you speak severely well, to them? No, they requested the meeting. <laughs> they requested the meeting. We went to a cafe, the auction rooms, probably the most expensive, expensive breakfast I've ever had, um, which I paid for. And uh, we had a civil conversation. Left, shook hands, and 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 that was the end of it. They went back and made a few notes, seen their internal lawyers, and the lawyers go, oh, "Well, there's nothing here." But 18 months later, when there's a political witch hunt that's on, you know, with the Royal Commission, um, they decided, oh, well, in hindsight, now on reflection, we think that was war blackmailed. So it was all just a political beat-up, which and sort of... And you had 2,000 yeah. uh, union members uh, storm the... Didn't storm the court, but they uh, formed a very nice posse outside the court uh, supporting you. 
And in fact, uh, the charges were either withdrawn or found you found you had no case to answer, did you? Yeah, we were at a committal hearing in the magistrate's court, and it went for it went for about three years. This whole thing, and so you're in the media for three years. It has a you can imagine a detrimental effect on your family. I mean, blackmail is a terrible word. It's almost like I've got a photo of someone. Like, well, being a pedophile yeah. or something. Or, like, exactly, or, or, or a photo of someone doing something with an animal they should be and I'm trying to extract money out of them. So it's a, <laughs> it's a terrible sort of... That word blackmail is just in itself. And so for three years, you, you know, your family suffers, your kids suffer, your parents suffer. and all, you know, It has an impact on your whole family. Uh, you know, when your phone's been tapped for six months and every word you've ever said is, you know, you get a suitcase delivered with a whole heap of folders of every conversation you've ever had on the phone... Um, yeah, it's a pretty sort of terrible thing to go through and to be, when the case collapsed and the way it collapsed and, and the political interference that was that was still coming out and it was just disgusting. Yeah, you know, you know, we had one person made about 45 statements before they got it right. You know, the police kept saying, oh, federal police this is. Uh, well, look, this statement's not good enough. We can't charge it. So he, he, it took him 44 or 45 times before he got it right. Uh, well, that's the sort of stuff that went on and the whole case collapsed and, and pretty and, disgraceful. And you got a... you. You got a settlement out of it, uh, did you? No. Get, you, you or the union get a settlement out of it? No, no. There was a small settlement on some legal fees, but there's never been a uh, there's never been a settlement. I mean, Borrell never put their hands up and said we're sorry for what we did to you and your family, and uh, and 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 you know you drag your name like you know my kids are going to school and you got other parents that are too scared to let their kids have a play date because it's all over the news, blackmailers. They, all sorts of stuff. So it, it does, it throws your life in the, you know, not, I can handle it, but, you know, the rest of my family, that they shouldn't have to have put up with that. You know, media camped outside your house, yeah, uh, yeah all sorts uh, of allegations. I, I, I know what that's like, John. <laughs> yeah, I bet uh, you do. <laughs> so, so you were charged with blackmail, but I noticed they, this seemed to be a parallel thing. I noticed Jackie Lambie said that she wouldn't vote, she wouldn't, she wouldn't vote for a bill a union bill, unless uh, it wasn't passed or whatever, she that seemed to be holding the uh, co- uh, holding parliament. Uh, she was the deciding vote, and she said, unless they uh, drop the union, uh, unless they drop the piece of leg- legislation that gave the union unions a free ride, she wouldn't vote for it. That seemed like blackmail to me as well. Oh well, there's all sorts of blackmail. <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, 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 what they were effectively saying. If if I sit down with an employer now, you know, when you negotiate and you say, "Listen, if you don't agree to these this EBA that we've put to you that we've negotiated, we're going to have to be forced to go to protected industrial action." If that case had got up against me, you wouldn't be allowed to do that. So it's like everything you say would be blackmail. I mean, everything you can go to a supermarket and say, "Look, we'll sell you this for this much. If you don't, we'll go somewhere else." Well, that'd be seen as blackmail. That's how ridiculous it was, you know, and. And to put me and my family through the washing machine over, uh, over that, it, it is, for me, it's just unforg- un- unforgivable, to be quite honest. So you've mentioned your family uh, a few times, and I, I can, uh, as I say, I can resonate with almost everything you say, but uh, you, as I say, you're far more important and far more probably controversial than me. But uh, how have your family, how do you shield your family from this? And do you sit down and say to them, look... Um, uh, this is not guilt by association. I do what I do because I'm, um, I do it on behalf of the members. How do they handle it and uh, how do you tell them to handle uh, the, the naysayers that they meet in life? Look, my eldest son was, was older. He, he represents a union on site, so he understood he was all right. But your two younger kids, they, they sort of uh, – you try and shield them. You, you don't have the news on, you know, like you make sure the TV's not on with the news and, and they sort of hear snippets and – when they go to school, you know, kids can be a bit cruel sometimes, but I mean, my kids are pretty proud of what I do. They yeah. actually once said to me, they don't want me to resign. They love me being the secretary of the union, so they're pretty proud of it. And look, a lot of their teachers at school were very protective of them, which I, I really appreciated. It was really good. They sort of, you know, they could see through all the, what was going on, but you can't really protect them from it because it's out in the media. You know, you had the media stalking the school, you know, ringing up the school and asking what time was I coming to pick up the kids from school and all that sort of... And, 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 and thankfully, the teachers were fantastic in, in protecting them, but you can't really protect them, you know? And, um, you know, to live a life where you couldn't even have a conversation in your own house with your wife, you know? We had to go outside and have conversations facing the fence, you know? <laughs> it's just... You think, gee, what am I, El, El Chapo or whatever? It was just absolutely ridiculous. Now, I, I might... Get on to conversations you've had with your wife uh, in a minute, uh, John. But um, 
So, in a very sensible attempt to uh, get some PR in your favour, I think you enlisted the support of um, the Richmond Football Club star and Brownlow medalist Dustin Martin, uh, who is an ally or friend of yours. Oh, look, I, I, I've met him a couple of times. His uncle is actually a, a, a delegate of ours that represents a union. So, I mean, I think, he's, I think a couple of his brothers are also CFMU members that work on site. Yeah. Well, so, I, I yeah. know, I'd like to say, I know Dustin pretty well. And he's a yeah. very good man. Uh, and I've, I've, I've met you once before uh, at a uh, golf charity day out at Woodlands, I think it was, yeah. or somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, oh, it wasn't Woodlands. It uh, was, uh, no, I know. Where it's, the I've, other side of town. Yeah. Yes, I know. Um, so, um, yeah, so you got expelled from... I've got a feeling you think um, um, men get a rough deal when there's um, a family and domestic issues in, um, in, in, in courts and legal, uh, they get the rough end of the stick because most people stick with the uh, female side of things and I think did you not get expelled from the ALP for some edgy comments you said about Rosie Batty? Well, I actually never got expelled. I actually took the ALP to court over it and in the end I actually resigned over a, over a trade agreement that the ALP had signed. So I actually never got expelled, I resigned on my own terms. Um, yes, and, and I had the Prime Minister who came out and talked about comments that I made about Rose Batty which were completely untrue. There was people in the room that actually weren't friends of mine who said, we don't have a problem with it because he never ever said that. So... You got taken 50, out of context. Taken yep. completely out of context. Uh, we love to do that, the media, John. <laughs> well, no, that, that, uh, that's, uh, that's clickbait stuff, and I was yeah. just, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying uh, that's you would know that's the nature of anyone that prints or writes or films a story about anyone in the media in the uh, public arena that uh, unless it's controversial and salacious, it doesn't sell. Well, the worst of it was Sam where. I used to look at Rose Batty on TV and I sort of, I, I, it was tragically the way her son died, you know. I mean, it was, gee, yep. you know what, as a parent, you wouldn't. And I used to look at it and think, how brave is she to be able to do that? Like, be able to march out there and do what she's doing. And I sort of thought to myself, would I have the strength to do that after, you know, losing, you know, a child in the manner that she lost a child? So I, I had this admiration for us, which I still do. And then to be accused of, of saying that about her, you know, things being taken out of context for me it was just, just. I, I actually ignored it at first because I thought, well, I never ever said that, so I just ignored it. I just couldn't believe the head of steam that 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 happened, and um, you know, people that actually weren't my friends that were my enemies in the meeting even come out and said he never said that. We're in the meeting, he never said that. So, so something untrue, how we could grow legs like that is just for me, it's just you know, you. Just when you think you've seen everything, <laughs> uh, something like that happens. Yeah, it'd be all indirect, indirectly linked to the Me Too movement, and uh, uh, which is a, yeah. a very good movement. But um, uh, sometimes it's not quite as people think it is now. So you've had a bit of a <laughs> you've had a bit of a I would say or not a run in. I'd say with your is your what is your is Emma still your ex? Is she your ex wife? She's still my wife. She's uh, still your wife. Yes, she's still my wife. Regardless of media reports that she's not, she's still my wife. Yes. And uh, this is uh, this is uh, you don't have to answer any of this, of course, John. But how are we going with Emma? It's, uh, I, 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 it says <laughs> she, it's threatened to kill you once. Uh, that that would uh, be just a throwaway line, uh, like saying, uh, "I'll kill you one day, yeah, yeah. Uh, John." And uh, you're a good man, but I've nearly had enough of you. Uh, that's how yeah. those things start, is it? Uh, the, the, I know she. I noticed she held your hand uh, when. She took you to court. I think she held your hand outside the court. Yeah. Uh, if that's not uh, if that's not a contradiction in terms, I don't know what is. So how are we going there? Yeah, we, we're going all right. <laughs> going, going pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> going pretty regardless of. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask the mainstream media, they'd have a different story. No, but well, I'm I'm asking yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, look, look, it's all going pretty good. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, look, it's been a rough, rough patch as. You know, marriages and relationships all go through rough patches. Yeah, you tell know, me uh, about that, will you? Oh, Jesus! I've had several talk goes. Talk about it? a rough patch, like a quicksand sometimes. But I mean, look, it's look, it's just one of them things. When a family gets put under pressure, and you know, uh, people are suffering from post traumatic stress disorder, from you know, you know, being a, in the nature, I was arrested in the car in the back street of North Melbourne with my children on board over these trumped up blackmail charges, and the way it happened on a Sunday on our way to buy a Christmas tree. Um, it's pretty traumatic for the whole family and uh, 
you know, some people, sometimes the person in the eye of the storm doesn't suffer as much, and, and as has been sort of said to me, I had a support network, you know, you, you go to work, you've got thousands of members that support you, and unfortunately your family hasn't got that sometimes, and, and, and they're the ones that really suffer out of it. And, uh, and there's a whole knock-on effect, and, and people getting involved and wanting to blow things up into what they weren't. It was just, you know, where people should be putting their arm around you and sort of trying to be supported, if they just for their own means, just, it's... You see the worst side of humanity, you know, at a situation like that. In case people thought I was laughing, I, I, I was laughing at your uh, sort of disagreement with your wife. I, I wasn't <laughs> laughing at the fact that uh, you got there was some serious accusations. I was just laughing at the fact that sometimes people don't quite see. I know, I know this <laughs> don't quite see things the way they are. I, I, as a result of that, I think you had to embark on a men's behavioural program, did you not? Did the court yeah. ask you to do that? And I'm yeah. asking you, in case I have to do it, what does I, that entail, a men's behavioural program? Uh, well, I've I done an alternative one, because the men's behavioural one that they get you to do, everyone, t all the experts told me it was a waste of time. Um, <laughs> and this is over over some text messages, which which weren't flattering, you know, I'm not yeah. sort of proud of that, and, no. and I owned up to it. You know, if yeah. I do, I'm in the old school, if I've done something wrong, I put my hand up and I own up to it, you know, but if I haven't... I'll this is, was to Emma. Yes, yes, mm. yes. In the heat of a thing, you know, you yeah. sent a few messages I wasn't proud of and that. But anyway, as, as right. husbands and wives do sometimes to yeah. one another, I mean, there's no, there no, nothing threatening or anything like that. But look, there's a bit of bad language. But anyway, I'm not proud of that. And, and I've owned up to it and I've put my hand up for it. And yeah, so it's just one of them. But then to, for the hysteria to them follow, it's almost <laughs> like I've, 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 I've bashed all these women and kids. And I, I just don't know where these people, you know, read the facts. I mean, you know, I. I yeah, there's been a lot of allegations made about us, like I'm the worst person in the world. Uh, in the heat of the moment and the pressure that the whole family got put under, I mean, yeah, everyone breaks a little bit, you know, and there's no excuse for it. And you yeah, just get to the point where you can't even have an argument with anyone anymore because as soon as you have an argument these days, sometimes it's portrayed as domestic violence, which is a little bit of that woke, you know. I mean, my view is anyone that hurts women and children should be thrown in jail, you know, and I think they'd stop some of the... Uh, violence that does happen to men and women are uh, to well predominantly to women and, and children i think there's nothing more disgusting than you know perpetrators of violence against women and children um but then in the whole thing you, you shouldn't make a whole heap of other people suffer because of a handful of people who have done the wrong thing you know and, and i think sometimes the system is is not really fair and people want to get up and talk about equality well you know equality works both ways you know and and i think as a, as australia We've talked about a fair go for everyone, and that should mean everyone. So how are you handling, uh, well, you won't have to handle it uh, at the end of the year, but how, how have you handled the, the trend uh, which is coming from overseas about diversity and inclusion and equity and giving people a job on um, the quota system rather than the meritocracy? And in your industry, which is, I presume, predominantly male-oriented, have you been under pressure from governments and legislative bodies and pressure groups to include uh, f include certain races and people in your industry just to fill a quota and make everyone feel uh, squeaky keen, clean and virtuous about themselves? Look, look, Sam, our industry is pretty multicultural, so there's never been any pressure about you know certain minority groups and that. So that's already sorts itself out, and, and we sort of. We look after everyone, and we got from all walks of life, and we respect all their religions, their colour. We don't care what colour your skin is, where you come from, who your parents were. If you're a CFMU member, you're a fellow brother and sister. In regards to the women, we've had a policy of uh, we've got a lot of women on site. We've got three union officials, women union officials in our union. Uh, we've got a number of shop stewards, delegates as women, and that's increasing. Uh, so we've got a lot of women in the building industry. And let me now tell you, got th they've got there on their merit. They've got there on their merit. I'm not a big believer. Uh, uh, what I am, Sam, is if there's a job going for 10 people and and 10 women apply for it and 10 men apply for it, if the 10 women are the best ones for that job, well, they should all get it. You yeah. know, there shouldn't be this thing. That's I believe you should be the best person for the job. That's the meritocracy. But, but, but our job has been to remove the obstacles for women because there was obstacles put in place where if you're a man, you didn't have to worry about it. If you're a woman, there was an obstacle there. We've removed all that. And I mean, look, I've got two sons and a daughter. And I'd like to think my daughter, if she does end up working on a building site, which is a good career path these days, uh, she'll have the same opportunities as what my sons have, you know. And, and, and that's been our job. And we've been pretty successful in that, in pushing that, that agenda. And, and the women, on, let me tell you, they, 
some of the women there, they, 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 uh, you should see them labour. They labour harder than some of the men, and they're, they're pretty staunch. They're, they're pretty hard up. And, hey, they'll, most of them, will ne- you'll never leave a room wondering what they're thinking. They'll tell you straight up, and that's what I like about them. And they're, they're, they're good unionists, and they're good people, and they, and they want a good career, and they, and they love the building industry. And, you're, and you, you are there boss, for want of a better word, of the people who are in the CFMEU, well, yeah, you yeah, yeah, run that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I say to them, and they're uh, my bosses because they pay my wages, so they're technically no, no, my but bosses. But, yeah, yeah, but I you're charged yeah. with yeah. running the thing as efficiently and as properly as you can, and uh, yeah. uh, you have no problem, uh, and I'm sure you um, uh, say to them what you'd say to any man. I, uh, yeah, I, look, I'm not into this woke, woke stuff. I mean, this woke thing, I think, is just wrecking the whole world, to be quite honest, and I mean, uh, for me, it's all about equality, and... Uh, you know, we, we, we teach some of our uh, male members, sometimes you've got to be, be watch what you say too. You know, they think something's funny and that. And we say, listen, pretend you're working, uh, pretend the person working with you uh, is somebody's mother, somebody's sister, somebody's daughter, somebody's niece. How would you, if it was yours, how would you, how would you treat them, you know? And, and that sort of resonates with people. And um, we, we've sort of taught, look, everything changes, you know? The world, world doesn't stand still. But, I mean, uh, for me, um, this stuff where... You know, you'll have someone, you've got the old style uh, labourer or carpenter who might say, call, call a girl, oh, listen, Dale, in, yeah. in a nice way, and people that are retaliated, don't you call me. I mean, come on, they're, they're, you know, you just go to a milk bar. Uh, the women I, in the milk bar call you love. Yes, love, what would you like? I mean, John, you can't say that anymore because you could get sent to Alcatraz or Guantanamo Bay. 95% for of the community agree with that, John, but it's the 5% of people. You've got to, you would have to be on your guard so that you have people, opportunists, and whether they're men or women, just want to take it a task and uh, for just because you are politically incorrect. Uh, not just you, but this is what's happening all over and you've so, got to be yeah. so careful about what you say or do when it's uh, tongue-in-cheek and it's meant to be, it's actually meant to be a, a, a pleasant thing to do. It suddenly it can rebound on you and you think, shit... Uh, yeah. It wasn't meant to be like that. Um, well, well, a, yeah. well yeah. Sam, look, I'm, I'm that old school. I'll still hold the door open for a woman. People tell me, oh, you shouldn't do that anymore. So why not? That's how I was taught. I'll get up and give my seat up to, to a woman on a, on a tram or elderly on the tram. On a, on a, and people have said to me, don't do that. People have been abused for that because they get told I can stand on my own two feet. I said, I don't care. I've never <laughs> been abused. That's how I was brought up. That's what I still do. I uh, At the lift at the apartments that I live, I'll... I'll even up from the first one there, I'll let the ladies go in first and I hold a lift for them. And, and I mean, that's how I was... I'm, I'm sick of people telling me, you shouldn't do that anymore because it's not really politically correct. I said, are, are you serious? <laughs> this is extraordinary, John. Uh, people listening to this, this will think I'm speaking to someone called John Setka, who is actually not the John Setka that they uh, thought that uh, he was. Uh, that is the Victorian Secretary of the CF, double MEU. Uh, I noticed the CFMEU's flag now has changed to the Indigenous colours. Uh, was that... Uh, why, why did we do that? Well, we what, used to be the uh, blue and white, yeah, yeah. and now it's the uh, no, red... Yeah. Yeah, we've Yellow still, and black. Yeah, we've still got our, uh, our our normal flags, but we've also done a whole heap of Indigenous flags. We've got a lot of Indigenous members of ours, you know, working on yep. site. And uh, and we're sort of at the forefront for, you know, I've done a cultural awareness thing in, 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 in what's what, what's happened to, to, to Indigenous, you know, First Nations people. And and, uh, and and it's pretty disturbing when you think... What has history. happened to them? Oh well, you know, you know, like, like, you know, the, the, you know, people used to be issued farmers used to be issued of permits to be able to shoot, you know, uh, Aboriginal people. I mean, it, 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 the history is pretty bad, you know, f- for what's happened, and 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 like people have criticised us. So on our calendar, we have Australia Day. Um, mm-hmm. We've put Australia Day, and then we've put Invasion Day. And I sort of say to people, it's a bit of an awareness thing, and you might not agree with it, but I mean. I think uh, a lot of them have been sort of unfairly uh, treated, like, uh, and 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 I think the real story should come out, and then people can move on. You know, um, they were here before we were. You know, and uh, and yeah, I'm not into this woke stuff, but I know a lot of indigenous, good, hard working indigenous yes. people, and. Uh, you know the stolen generation. You know, you know where where kids were just taken off and they never ever seen them again. And, and you said we can only just imagine what that would have been like. You know, and, well, and we, we we can you know. can imagine what that would be like. But there's a lot of different reasons they were taken off them. Uh, and invasion day. So you're happy with that 
term to be called Invasion Day because uh, it's yeah. a sort of a divisive thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we are here today and you do what you do today and uh, lead a successful life because someone came here uh, originally and built the country into what it is. Your people built the country into what it is, didn't yeah. they? Oh, of course they did. But, uh, oh, but what, what I'm saying is... Um, no, you're you know, saying it well, John. Yeah, I'm what, just what, yeah, what I'm saying is for them... You know, like that day, Australia Day, for some of them, conjures up memories, you know, of, uh, yes. you know, for them. And, I, and and people, we're sort of make, trying to make people understand why they would be hostile to it, you yep. know. So we've still got Australia Day written in there, but we've also got Invasion Day just to let people, well, start the conversation, you know, have the conversation. I mean, it's a good idea not to have the conversation. The more you talk about it, the more people take sides and become advocates. If we all just stop talking about it, maybe we'd all get on better. And anyhow, yeah. John, uh, so <laughs> we are... His Australia is historically a blue-collar country, isn't it? Um, historically, I'm staggered yeah. how yeah. the Liberals... I'm st staggered how Conservative governments ever get into power because we are basically a blue-collar country. Well, and and yeah. you have you are at the forefront of that. <laughs> you, you have become a hero for blue collar people, John. Not wishing yeah. to pump you up any more than <laughs> people have, or else they'll think I'm. Um, they'll yeah. Think I'm not. Um, this is a soft interview. Yeah. But I'm just uh, just saying to you, I'm staggered how conservatives ever get into power. Well. It astounds me too sometimes. I mean, especially when they sort of say, we're going to take all your rights away from you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then they go still vote for them. I mean, look, I, th I think in Australia, we've never really had to fight for anything. You know, like other countries in the world, they've had to fight. They've had revolutions. They've had all sorts of things. And I think we're lucky in a way we've never had to fight for something. But, but because of that, I I'd say a, a lot of people in Australia, we're, we're sometimes a bit politically dumb, to be quite honest. Like, I mean... I hear some policies the ALP put out there, and I think, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you fair income? Uh, but then I'll hear some of the liberal policies. I think that's actually not a bad idea. So I think uh, you've got to be. People have actually got to look into it because it's important. Because it's, it's it's your future. It's your kids' future. You know, and our governments do change countries. You know, and um, and sometimes for the worst, and, and hopefully most of the time for the better. So I just think um, I, I think Australians have got to get a bit more of aware of what's going on uh, with politics and what they're actually saying because I sometimes think the messaging... And, you know, I think politicians have got to get out there and actually say what they actually mean. They all talk in little... It, it, you almost need an interpreter to work out what they're saying. So, I mean, just yeah, be that honest. That is true. Yeah, be honest. Just just be honest. Go back to your grassroots. Be honest. Tell, like, what's the biggest thing people want to know? Well, what's happened to the groceries? You know, how does a slab of water go up $4 in two weeks? I mean, gee, it's... it's petrol's uh, cheaper than water now. I mean, how does this happen, you know? So politicians ought to get out there and sort of call it as it is, you know, and, and be honest. And, and they might get a bit of criticism, but I, I think being honest and, and seeing what most Australians want, they would get a lot further than, than some of the wokey stuff that they do at the moment. Now, of the people you do battle with, your advers adversaries, who do you respect? Uh, I, I would, I, I, are you a fair man when you uh, sit down to speak to people and who generally, on the opposite side of what you're on about, is generally fair with you or the fairest? Look, Sam, most of our uh, builders and the subcontractors and developers that we deal with... Uh, we're, we're pretty fair with them. We've got a, actually a very, very good relationship with them. You know, there's not many companies out there that, you know, uh, hang shit on the union or... I mean, we have moved... You know, we, we, we say to people, I mean, they employ our members. See, a builder employs our members. Their subcontractor employs our members. What interest is it for us to send him broke or cost him money? I mean, it just... It's, it, 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 you know, it's, it's like shitting in your own... Hat. Why would you yeah. do that? So we've got an obligation to look after our members make sure the jobs uh, are safe. But we also have got an obligation to make sure that job finishes on time. And if you look at these railway crossing removal works that have been going on, I mean, on a lot of them jobs, and you never read this in the papers, they're delivered uh, uh, ahead of schedule and under budget. You know, so, I mean... Under well, budget. Yes. Uh, this is talking about the Westgate Freeway uh, tunnel thing, which is $3 billion over uh, budget. Level crossings I was talking about. Yeah, no... <laughs> So, so you you get on f well with those people, but you surely, John, you strike a pretty hard uh, talking point with the benefits and entitlements and the 
loadings on working and holidays and you work a pretty tough line with that which sometimes does send some of the smaller construction people out of business does it not well or is that never, too dramatic to say that that probably is dramatic. We've never seen anyone broke off our wages. I mean, if you look at the housing industry, where we don't cover the housing industry, the housing industry is virtually non-union. They're all collapsing and going broke. I mean, that's got nothing to do with us. I mean, I know they'd love to probably blame us for that, and they probably do, but I mean, that's got nothing to do with us. I mean, uh, it, what a lot of people don't realise, Sam, is, you know, like some of these house builders, for example, and some of these other construction companies, price jobs three years, they price job that might not start for another two years. You know, materials went up nearly 30%. So all of a sudden, they're doing a job. The price has gone up 30%. They can't go back and say, we want more money out of you. So in the end, it's just easier for them to go broke. And that's what they do. It's got nothing to do with the union. So I know we get blamed for it, but I mean, it, it, and in relation to our wages and conditions, we do drive a hard bargain. But we know what the industry can afford. And we sit down off everyone around the table. It's not like the old days... You know, yeah, yeah, kicking down doors and all the rest of it and that and picket lines. It's very rare to see that, to be quite honest, these days. So we sit down and have negotiations and most of the negotiations, the last blue we actually had in the construction industry, uh, you know, as an industry, as a whole industry blue, was the 36-hour week when we won that in 2001, you know. Uh, since then, there's been no wholesale blue in the building industry. It's all pretty amicable. We sit down there, we'll argue, and look, we're a bit like a relationship, you know, you've got a husband and wife and a, uh, or a husband and husband or whatever, I don't know what you're politically allowed to say anymore, you're allowed to say husband and wife, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, we'll say a couple, let's say, you've got yeah. a couple there. You know what, they'll have their little skirmishes, they might not talk for two or three days, they'll kiss and make up and they just move on and that's how it works and that's what the building industry is like. We'll have our little spats and our little blues and, you know, people go to their corners and have a little sook and all that, but in the end... We're all stakeholders in this industry. We've got an obligation to make sure our members get good wages, conditions, and more importantly, go home safe. But we've also got an obligation to make sure that job gets delivered on time, on budget, and that all the contractors and the builders actually make money because they employ our members. Yeah, so you see the, uh, the, 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 the construction managers driving the luxury cars and got the holiday beach houses and living the high life, and you say, well... We would like a slice of that, and that's fair enough. And uh, there's only so much, uh, uh, so much money you could want to re gather around yourselves. How about sharing it out a bit with the people who uh, give, make you all this money? That's the fine line between what you do and uh, the management of uh, these construction companies, isn't it? Oh, exactly. And, and well, good luck to them. If they're making fifty million dollars and they're driving bigger cars, good luck to them. They employ our members, but as long as our members aren't being ripped off. That, that's all I ask. Just be fair. Everyone, everyone you know, you just got to be fair. So you said, uh, I, I've, I've just looked up what this word means. You said you um, drove an Alley Mac. Uh, is that yeah. an elevator? Well, look, my... Is that well, an elevator that yeah, goes it's up an elevator. So you see you those see things that are strapped <laughs> onto the side of 50-storey <laughs> yeah, buildings right. and you think, shit, who would get yeah, in that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, someone told me, someone yeah. told me, that the first time you got in an Alley Mac, this is John Setka, as I'm looking at you now, it looks yeah, as though yeah. you, you've got muscles on your muscles. Uh, you look like uh, Don Othaldo. Uh, <laughs> you shit yourself when you got in the Alley Mac. Well, look, my Come first, on, mate. Yeah, yeah, my first day, grew up in Footscray. We thought we were pretty tough in Footscray. Went on there, my first day on a building site. And I worked on housing, but that's a bit different. I went, went, went on a building site, and uh, when I first hopped in the Alley Mac, well, Walking into a smoker room was a scary experience itself. But, I mean, then going into an alley, they called them an alley mac, them lifts. When this thing started going up, this is like 80, 1984, I, 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 I tell you what, you, you had to act tough for that. I thought this thing was going to fall off the side of the building. I just wanted to scream. This thing just rattled and rolled. I mean, they're pretty rough today. Back then, it was like something out of the Flintstones, and, and I just <laughs> go to myself, but we don't get paid enough for this. This is, you know... And then you get used to it like everything else, but and, and they were pretty safe. But yeah, the only other lift you've ever been on is an internal lift of, of a building, and then you hop in one of them and you think, oh my God. Is, is Mick Gatto a, a colleague, or is he is he work in the same uh, same general area as you, or, or yeah, does he, he yeah. settle settle disputes on your behalf, or do you uh, you adv use his as a, him as an advocate for you, or are you separate no. people? No, no, we, we, he's got his own business, he's, he's arbitrations and mediations, and what will happen is people, if they've got a bit of a problem, they don't know how to go through it, 
they'll either go to an employer organisation, but what a lot of them do, that they'll go to Mick, and Mick's got a, a lot of contacts there. He's got a he's got a good nature about him, regardless of what they write about him. He's actually got a good good nature. He, he, he's an absolute gentleman. You can sit down with him. You can talk. He, he'll listen to both sides of the story. And you know, we've had cases where he's brought in a company. We've had a few problems with and. And once we have the little argument there, he, 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 if he feels the company's actually, they weren't fair and weren't doing it, he'll pull them up and, and say, listen, even though you're paying me, you're not doing the right thing. You, 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 you've got to fix that. You can't do that anymore. You've got to pay these people properly. You've got to do that. So he's more or less, uh, 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 he's a mediator and arbitrator and he goes in and, he, and he, he's got a very good success rate in sorting out disputes. Now, John, as uh, always, when I finish uh, speaking to people, uh, we get off, uh, we turn all this off, and someone says, why didn't you ask him this? Or, geez, didn't you know he did this? And I say, well, shit, thanks for telling us now. I don't know what I've forgotten to ask you. Someone will say you haven't asked him the main things about what makes him tick. Uh, All I'm uh, just going to say... are you thinking when you're going on a holiday when this is all over? Do you travel overseas? Are you well regarded in the union movement overseas? Do you have colleagues over there? And you might take the missus over. This could be a, just a great uh, panacea to uh, bring you both together again. And uh, you could take her overseas and let bygones be bygones and uh, things might go from... Just go into the atmosphere. It might be fantastic. Might be absolute bliss, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, yeah. Look, I, I don't... I don't. I don't really know what I'm sort of going to do. I mean, do you fish? I do. I used to fish. I used to have uh, uh, I had two boats at one stage. I used to love fishing, and uh, it, used to, yeah, it used to cost me about four four thousand dollars a kilo for flathead uh, <laughs> because boats aren't exactly cheap. Right? <laughs> anyway, um, and look, I've always sort of said. Then you get busy when you become the secretary, and I got rid of you know uh, yeah, the boats, and I wouldn't mind getting a boat again, you know, and, yeah. and going out and doing a bit of fishing, or or or, or maybe just by the banks of the Barramurunga River and just throw in a rod and just yeah. relax a bit. But um, and I've got a feeling golf's not your long suit because uh, with arms like that, mate, you've got to have flexibility well, and rhythm. Well, I, my son likes golf and we went somewhere through a shooting range once and uh, I said, ah, give me 100. He goes, Dad, it's too many. Ah, just give me 100. Let me tell you, I swung about 20 of them. I said to him, you don't know what I said to him. I gave him the bucket and the golf clubs and he said, I told you it was too many. I went down, I used to smoke and had a cigarette and, and a beer. And the next day I had muscles that I didn't even know I had were, were absolutely killing me. So I've not touched the golf club since. So, uh, and I'll take my hat off to him because it is actually, you actually got to be physically, you know, it, it, it does uh, test your muscles. But yeah. Look. Anyhow, John Setka, you're an engaging man and uh, um, your reputation precedes you uh, like uh, all our reputations precede us. But it's been a delight to chat to you. I don't know if people will think, oh, gee, you're like, they always say, oh, well, you've gone easy on. I don't know how I've gone easy. I've got other questions I could ask you. But it's been fantastic of you to come in I really appreciate it because you must shy away from dickheads like me who, who, uh, and people who want to um, just uh, chat to you and try and upend you and uh, we're not trying to do any of that we just like to ask you the questions and your answers are the most important so thank you very much for coming in no, My pleasure, thanks very much Sam, thank All you right.